if he was asking if if if, if he cites four kind of lines can be directly whatever 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 rises uh, independence whatever rises independence so we should give, again is citing uh, a quote he's giving a quote So that um, that phenomenon, so that which arises in dependence, is not that. It's not exactly that. So that which arises in dependence is not exactly that. And this is also not different. It is also not different from that. So this, so this is uh, uh, this is from the root wisdom. So this one, uh, therefore, uh, this describes being free from the two types of extremes. So this comes a little later down in the text. And it has not been, this is the part of the text that hasn't been translated into English or into Chinese yet. So this part of the root wisdom and Buddha Palita's commentary, it comes later down or it's further down in the text. So what, what Geshe Le will do today, he will not give you a review class, uh, but instead prepare you for uh, the teachings by His Holiness to come. So the teachings His Holiness will give tomorrow or the day after, uh, just so if Geshe Le already gives you some explanation on that, it will be easier for, to, for you to understand what His Holiness will talk about. So, um, Buddha Palita's text here is a commentary on the root wisdom on the Mula Madhyamaka Karika by Nagajina, and so therefore it sets forth emptiness. So, what is the meaning of emptiness? If this presents, if this text presents emptiness, therefore what is the meaning of emptiness? So someone who has not studied the scriptures, if they hear the word emptiness, they think of just some absence of just empty. To them, what arises to the mind is just empty, nothing else. So when we talk about here empty, the word empty, just the word itself, the etymology of the word emptiness, here what it refers to is uh, absence of or the lack of something existing from its own side. So this is the meaning of emptiness here, the absence of a phenomenon existing from its own side. So when we say to exist from its own side, here this kind of uh, this this the meaning of this existing from its own side. We also use this in colloquial. So from my side, I've done everything I could, but from his side, this person has not helped me. So it's the same kind of sense from the side, of my side, or the other person. So, for instance, if we see a person as negative, as, as harmful, as bad, but if we're able to understand that 
from the side of the person, this person who we see as negative, they're not really negative. This has only to do with our own mind. Our mind perceives this person to be negative. If we can really get a sense of that, that it's from our own mind uh, that we have the sense that it comes from the side of our mind that we see the person as negative, then the anger we experience with regard to that person will be reduced. So, when we think this other person from his own side, he's not actually harming me. So, it's difficult to think along those lines. This person from his own side has not harmed me. But if we can think along those lines, if we can think this person from his own side has not harmed me, then our anger, the anger directed at that person, will be reduced. So in general we say a phenomenon existing from its own side. This is what we're saying does not exist. So this is what we're refuting, what we're negating here. A phenomenon existing from its own side. So when we see phenomena, when we see things, when we see people and so forth, so all these various different phenomena, we see a variety of different things, of different phenomena. So, for instance, when we take the object, the book, Gishla is holding this book. So, when we look at this book, we say, this is different from the microphone. It is different from the cup. It is different from the MP3 player. It is different from the table. It is different from the people around us. So, we, we differentiate, we distinguish this phenomenon as being different from the things around the, the book. So it is, it is, it is unique in the sense it's different from everything other than itself. So it becomes a unique object in that sense. If you see it as something different uh, from anything that is not itself, then it becomes a unique phenomenon. So we see it's like a unique object. Therefore, when we look at it. There's a unique object that we perceive. So we see it as something different, we see it as something unique there. So the way we perceive it is on top of it, it's in and of itself something unique. It seems to come from the side of the object that this book is unique from its own side. So when we have when we when we talk about this kind of appearance, this way uh, uh, of seeing the object, this refers to the phenomena appears to exist by way of its own character. So saying that there's a sense it exists from its own side is the same as saying it exists by way of its own character. <laughs> <laughs> so what Nagarjuna says is that these things appear to us, these different phenomena, these different entities appear to us to be different. We see them as very different. But then if someone tells us this is actually just coming from the side of the awareness, this comes from the side of our consciousness, from the side of our mind, it does not exist as a unique phenomenon from the side of the object, well, it's very difficult to believe that. It's very hard to actually believe that. So this is what Nagarjuna uh, explains, that there's no sense that phenomena actually do not exist from their own side, that it actually comes from our own mind, that we perceive them as unique, that we perceive them as having certain characteristics. So when we see the phenomena, we say, we can, with our direct perceiver, with our sense consciousness, with our direct perceiver, we can see the object as existing from its own side. So from our own experience, it's the direct perceiver that perceives them that way. So what are you saying? It doesn't exist that way. So our reaction, reaction would be, what are you saying if it doesn't exist, that it doesn't exist that way? 
So there's no surprise that the Buddhist philosophers, the Chitta Matra, the Tantrika, and the Chitta Matra, the, the Vaibhashikas, that they don't agree with this. There's no surprise. So, with regard to all these different phenomena, the mo- the way in which they appear to us, all these different things, so saying, this is a table, this is a book, this is a woman, this is a man, all these are uh, just uh, coming from this side. They're, they don't exist from their own side, but they come from the mind. So when we say they just appear, it's just by way of their appearance to the mind, uh, what is implied by that is that they do not exist by way of their own reality, by way of their own, from their own side. So when you say it don't exist in reality, that is in Tibetan, that really means like saying it doesn't really exist. It's not real. So when we say it's not real, we're saying in Tibetan then, uh, if it's not existing in reality, it's saying it's not real. So it's saying it's, 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 uh, it's false. So usually when we hear the, 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 the scriptures, when they talk about the object of negation of emptiness, they, just, they talk about uh, phenomena do not exist from their own side, phenomena do not exist by way of their own character. So this terminology is usually used. But then in the Mula Madhyamika Karika, in Nagarjuna's uh, root wisdom or Mula Madhyamika Karika, there's another term that is used, which is uh, in Tibetan kind of it means it doesn't exist by way of its own subsistence. It doesn't exist uh, by way of its own mode of subsistence. So this is a, a difficult word here, and it's usually explained to mean, this woman is, for instance, explains this to mean it doesn't exist by way of its own mode of abidance. It does not exist by way of its own mode of residing. So in that sense, it really comes down to not existing by way of its own mode of existence. So here the Tibetan Shisutuba as in like existing by way of its own mode of subsistence. So just below the homage in the uh, root wisdom that is in the Mula Matyamika Karika by Nagarjuna, uh, this term is used. So this word is used by Nagarjuna, Shisutuba or uh, existing by way of its own subsistence. And then, in the op- then you have the opposite, not existing by way of its own subsistence, which basically means not existing by way of its own mode of existence. So this basically means not existing in reality. It comes down to saying it doesn't exist in reality. So when we say it does not exist by way of its own reality, it does not exist really, uh, that is the same as saying a phenomenon does not exist ultimately. So here we say it doesn't exist by way of its own reality uh, to mean actually that the phenomenon does not exist ultimately. Mm-hmm. 
I see. So um, some masters, some scholars or some experts, what they say is they give an example uh, to get a sense of our, of, our, uh, of our notion of phenomena existing from their own side or existing in reality. For instance, a person walking on the street, if there's like a pillar in the middle of the street and they bump their head, they bump their head against the pillar, there's no sense that, oh, I just have this appearance of a pillar which I bumped my head against, but rather there's a, there's a pillar. There's a, there's a pillar there and I bump my head uh, so here there's a sense there's this true pillar over there and that gives us a sense of how we we perceive phenomena or phenomena appear as if they exist from their own side So the meaning of this is as follows. So with regard to the lower philosophical systems, the Satantrika, what the Satantrika says when you have phenomena, when you have things, things such as a book, if you take the book, they say that the book exists over there. The, 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 the book exists in and of itself. Uh, as a phenomenon that we just happen to, to see with our eye consciousness, we just perceive, we apply the name, we give the name book to it, we perceive it with our consciousness because there really is a book. And that book over there is a book. So this is how it appears to us. So in reality, there is a book, and that book just happens to appear to us. And it just happens to be something that we call a book. So on the basis of this book, kind of uh, throwing its own aspect, throwing its own nature towards our consciousness. So therefore, then first you have an eye consciousness, and thereafter a conceptual mind thinking book. So in reality, there is a book, and it is a book. So, therefore, there are some people or some scholars who say, because phenomena don't exist from their own side, it's not like their aspect is thrown at our mind. It's not like something is reflected in our mind, an object that exists over there. So, it doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist uh, towards, there's no existence from the side of the object such that it exists uh, kind of towards us, like it, it's kind of like throwing it. Yeah. So therefore, since it does not come from its own side, therefore we say it is from our side, we, 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 we um, impute the object. So there's nothing coming towards us, we move towards the object by imputing it. But some say we impute the object over there, so it comes from our side that we impute the object, so the movement comes from us towards the object. Some scholars criticize that. So the reason why they criticize that is that they say, if from our own, from us, so, so we impute the object over there, so this, this kind of movement goes from us towards the object, then there's a sense the object exists in reality, and we just call it such. So there's a sense this is not correct to say that from 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 the mind side, so from so we impute the object that it kind of moves that our mind moves towards the direction of the object that seems to apply the object exists from its own side and that could not be correct. So, 
uh, with regard to the way phenomena exist and the way they actually exist. So that kind of uh, gap between how phenomena appear and between how they actually exist. Here Chandagirti in, in one of his commentaries or in his commentary he speaks of for instance uh, if you're in a place uh, where the lighting is not very clear you can't see clearly you may have a, a rope a speckled rope that is coiled like a snake and on the basis of that rope you wrongly perceive there to be a snake so you perceive this 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 rope the speckled rope to be an actual snake and on the basis of that you, you're afraid that the snake bites you you you, you feel like it has to be thrown out you have to remove that snake so a lot of work a lot of uh, a lot of effort is required on the base or a lot of um, work arises actually out of the fear etc of uh, of the snake which is actually just based on a misperception so when we talk about now let's uh, this, if you find yourself in such a situation where you mistake a row for, to be a snake so then with your companions your friends you start discussing this also the snake may bite us it's dangerous we should throw out the snake we should get rid of the snake so all this discussion that you engage in with your friends with regard to the snake here you just uh, discussing the snake from the point of view of how it appears. It's just the mode of appearance that we're here discussing. There's not a snake in reality. There's not in reality a snake that would bite you or that could be dangerous to you. <laughs> So here, therefore, with regard to the, how this appears to the mind, the way it appears, uh, it's just that from our own side, from our own side, we then uh, impute, we posit this kind of snake. There's not like a snake that from its own side would bite us, that would be uh, any danger to us. So therefore, it's rather that it's from us, from our own side, that we posit the snake. Nothing is coming from the side of the snake itself. So here, uh, this is just an appearance. There's a mere appearance of the snake. There's not something from the side of the object, really, that can be called snake. But the person perceiving, mistakenly perceiving the snake is not aware of this. They feel there's really something coming from the side of the object. The thing itself uh, is a snake and uh, therefore it appears to us. There's no awareness of the object being a mere appearance. Not here. So likewise, with regard to all phenomena, all the different phenomena. So when we when we differentiate, uh, this is um, this is this is my this is oneself. This is other. So self and other, good and bad, harmful and beneficial. Something we should invite and something we should repel or we should get rid of. So all these these distinctions that we draw with regard to different phenomena, they only come from the from the point of view, they only arise because of the mere appearance. It's because of the appearance that we distinguish between phenomena in that way. So if we were to 
uh, leave aside the mode of appearance, if we were to totally uh, ignore that, or we were uh, we were able to actually take that out of the picture without depending on that appearance, we could not talk of self and other. We could not talk of good and bad. So without the, the sense of the mere appearance, if that was not part of the 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 the, the, the sense of how we perceive the phenomenon, if we were to just leave that out. Uh, this distinction could not take place. So here the example or the analogy is that of a dream. When you dream, let's say yesterday you had a dream. So you went, uh, you took a long trip, you took a long trip along a road. On the right side of the road there was this, on the left side of the road there was this, there was a house, there was a person. So you had this dream having the appearance of all these objects. If you were to leave this, leave aside the appearance to your mind of those different objects in your dream, you could not discuss the dream. So without actually uh, taking into consideration the mode of appearance to your mind, if you were to leave that aside, there would be no dream, there would be nothing to talk of. So this is the analogy that is given here, that phenomena exist as a mere appearance, just like in a dream. So, therefore, this is so. This is the explanation, therefore, of phenomena existing or not existing from their own side. So what the lower philosophical systems say, so the systems below the Pazangika school, what they say is that when you say phenomena are merely appearing, they do not exist from the side of the object, they, they, then these philosophers would say, Buddhist philosophers, they would say, well then, dependent arising is no longer possible. So this is what is discussed in the text here, in the first chapter of this text, uh, when it talks about uh, a phenomenon giving rise to something else. So for instance, a seed cannot give rise to a sprout if the object does not exist from its own side, or karma with regard to an action does not give rise to a certain result. So here, with respect to phenomena that have been generated, there's no going, there's no coming, etc., unless the phenomenon exists from its own side. But Nagarjuna, what Nagarjuna says is the opposite by saying that if phenomena were to exist not by, by way of their own mode of appearance or by way of their own appearance, or just or they would exist independent on appearing, uh, but they would exist from their own side, Nagarjuna would say if that were the case, phenomena could not exist. So the opposite of what the other philosopher says here. So here when we speak of dependent arising, the type of dependent arising that is common to all Buddhist philosophical system is twofold. Uh, dependence on uh, causes and conditions and uh, dependence on parts. So this is common, not just it's common to all the philosophers.
So when we talk about um, the dependence on parts here, when we speak of the dependence on parts, which is also accepted by some of the followers of the lower system. So here when we say the I or the person, from a Buddhist point of view, the person depends on the aggregates, on the mind and body complex, on the aggregates. Um, in contrast to that, non-Buddhist systems, they would say that the person, the I, the self, that exists independently. So non-Buddhist system would say that the self exists independently. So in general, when we say that there is a that there is a, a self that exists independent on mind, uh, independent on mind and body, then we would theoretically we would be able to uh, remove what makes up the person, so mind and body, the five aggregates. If we could remove those, we would be left with a self. So if there were a self that exists independently of those, we could remove those parts and still have a self. Um, so, if on the other hand we say that uh, the self exists independent on the aggregates, then when we say it exists by mere terminology, it's a uh, mere appearance, the phenomenon exists by way of merely appearing, well, if that's the case, then we can say, when my hand touches something, I touch the object. When my eye sees something, when my eye consciousness sees something, I see something. So, if on the other hand we say it's not that the phenomenon exists by way of mere appearance, then it exists from its own side, from it's, it's positive from its own side, so it exists independently, it must exist independently over there. So, to give another example that clarifies what Geshe Lat uh, explained previously, so for instance, someone touches uh, Geshe Lat's right shoulder. So, if someone touches the, 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 his right shoulder, then there's the thought, the, the thought arises, or the upper arm, Geshe Lat's upper arm, the thought arises, someone touched me. If it's someone uh, you dislike, a, 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 a bad person, a person you dislike, then the feeling that arises is that of displeasure. Whereas, on the other hand, if it's a person you like and they touch you, a feeling of pleasure arises. So, when someone touches me, so when the thought arises, this person touched me, so the kind of feeling here, when the kind of feeling, or the, the feeling that arises when it touched me, if we analyze, actually the person has not touched my mind. So that which has been touched is just the body. The body has been touched, some physical object has been touched. So, but of the body here, the head has not been touched, the left arm has not been touched, uh, the, 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 the lungs have not been touched, the legs have not been touched. Only the right arm. So, so it's actually only the area of the shoulder that has been touched, so none of the lower parts of the arm have been touched. So it's also not inside the shoulder, inside the upper arm. That has not been touched. It's just been the outside of a certain area on the arm or on the shoulder. And then if you talk about the skin that has been touched, it's not the internal part of the skin, but it's the external part, external part of the skin. 
So when you think about it, what actually has been touched is the area that Gishila just pointed out, like this area that he just showed. So there's only a very small area that actually has been physically touched. So therefore, uh, the, 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 the kind of thoughts that arise, the kind of conception that we have is, oh, oh, because of this little part that has been touched, so this person has touched me. If we like the person, we'd be happy, oh, this person has touched me, there'd be the light. Whereas if we don't like the person, there's dislike, there's resentment and so forth. So all these conceptions, they all arise as a, as a mere conception. So has the person not touched me? So this this place, this part of the skin that has been touched, that's not me, is it? So there's only the only place that has been touched is the skin. So I have not been touched. So saying I have been touched, that is just an appearance to the mind. So therefore, independence on the shoulder being touched, therefore the thought arises, I have been touched. So this is something that merely arises to the mind. So this is just a mere appearance to the mind, thinking that I have been touched. So all Buddhist philosophers would agree with that. <laughs> so when I say all Buddhist philosophers, well, a few would not agree. <laughs> so there are uh, some few who philosophers would disagree with that. So the Madhyamika, the, the followers of the Madhyamika philosophical system, they would say that here on, on the basis of the shoulder, the, the shoulder is the basis, and based on that, we impute I. So we impute the I on the basis of the shoulder. So here, on the basis of the hand that touched, or the arm that has been touched, so we impute the person on the basis of the arm. Or in other words, in general, we take part of the aggregate, or we take the aggregates on the basis of that, we impute or designate I, or the self. But if... The phenomenon were not just coming from the side of the mind, but were to exist in reality, then if we looked for the phenomenon, if we searched for the phenomenon, we should be able to find something. We should be able to, 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 uh, to find an object upon analysis. So therefore, in dependence on that analysis, the question that arises is, is the person, are the person and the self, the, are the person or the self and the aggregates different or not, or are they one? Are they indifferentiable or are they different? Are they inseparable as in like being identical or are they separate or different? So if they're one, if the, if the, if the self and the aggregates were one, um, then there's no dependence. You couldn't say one depends on the other because they're one. They're identical. So if they're separate, if they're different, again, there's no question of dependence. One cannot depend on the other. But this needs to be this needs to be specified when we say it's different here we're saying if it's truly if it's from its own side that two things are different so the self and the aggregates are truly are from their own side different then they exist totally uh, separate from each other which is why it would not make sense then to say that one depends on the other 
So saying that they do not exist as, uh, uh, as, as, as one or existing as separately or as different, there's no other alternative. There's no uh, third uh, uh, possibility. So therefore, as Gishla uh, cited the lines before, if it exists in dependence, if something arises in dependence on something else, it cannot be uh, one, it cannot be different. So it cannot exist um, from in reality as being one or as being different with promised parts. So in the first chapter, so in the first chapter, uh, what is set forth in the first chapter, what Nagarjuna sets forth in the Mula Madhyamika Karika is um, the dependence on causes and conditions. So describing, we're saying that the sprout exists in dependence on the on the seed. So the question then arises then also with respect to those two, the seed and the sprout, are they inherently one or are they inherently different? So if there are if they're inherently one, if the seed and the sprout are inherently one, um, um, then we cannot say one depends on the other because they're identical. If they are different, if they are different from their own side, that is inherently or objectively different, then again, we can't talk of one depending on the other. So therefore we say, since they depend on each other, since they're merely dependent, and because they're not uh, truly one or inherently one and not inherently different, therefore they do not exist from their own side. So therefore, because phenomena exist in dependence, because they arise in dependence, they do exist, but they do not exist from their own side. So in this sense that we're saying that phenomena not existing in reality, here this is what the Madhyamika sets forth, that they do not exist by way of their own reality, that is from their own side, but they do exist. So in dependence on that, we can understand both. So it's not as easy as Geshe-la just uh, describes it. So in reality, we need to investigate. And when we start in investigating it, uh, we need to we need to debate. We need to to go into analysis and debate this, and also answer, give an answer. Uh, on top of this, when we say something has been generated, has been produced in dependence, well, when we say it does not exist uh, as inherently one with its parts or inherently different from its parts, um, that is actually, that stands in, the, in contradiction to our perception. That stands in, this is contradictory to how we perceive phenomena. <laughs> So with regard to our, an, uh, our kind of innate perception, when we say a seed giving rise to a sprout, which then eventually grows into a fruit, there is no sense that those are one, that those are uh, identical, that they're identical. So there's, that's like identical. So there's no sense that they're identical with the seed, the sprout, and the fruit. Does it appear as if they were identical, those, those phenomena? So seeds sprout and, and fruit, do they appear to exist as being identical or as being one? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so in, for instance, if you take the food, the, 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 the ingredients for the food, so you take the raw vegetables, the raw rice, and then the resultant meal, if they were identical, you could just eat the raw ingredients because they're identical to the cooked food. <laughs> So at the, uh, at the same time, there's no sense, we, there's no uh, innate sense that uh, the, 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 the seed and the sprout, that they exist as inherently different, or as in like existing from their own side is different. So if we had a sense, if hypothetically we had a sense that the seed, So there's no innate sense that the seed and the sprout are uh, truly are inherently are inherently separate. Because if they did, there would be a sense that they're totally disconnected. But in actuality, they are not. So when we, for, for instance, when we uh, when we when we um, when we plant a seed, for instance, we usually don't say I plant a seed. We say we I plant a tree. So there's a sense that there's a connection between the seed and its resultant tree. So we don't perceive them as truly separate, as in like totally separate and disconnected, as like not connecting one, not connecting to the other. So therefore, Gena says that we also don't have a sense. We, we neither have a we don't have a sense that they're truly one, uh, but we also don't have a sense that they're truly separate or as like inherently or from their own side separate. Because otherwise, there would not be a sense that I plant a tree when actually planting a seed. So also with respect to imputation and dependence on, on, on a phenomenon here, when we speak of, uh, for instance, imp <laughs> when we speak of uh, 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 imputing something on the... So also with respect to um, uh, imputation here, so when someone uh, touches our arm or our shoulder, we don't think this person touched my hand. This is because uh, we dis distinguish between the head and the shoulder. We don't see them as identical. We don't see them as one, but rather we distinguish between those two, the shoulder as opposed to the, ar uh, the head. <laughs> So likewise, with respect to the self and the, the shoulder, we don't think those are identical. We don't think that they're identical. We are basically, so, so actually they don't exist from their own side as something identical because there's a difference between the two, but still we impute one on the base of the other. So therefore, we can say that that uh, which is dependent, and uh, so that which depends, so there's two phenomena, one depending on the other, they're neither, uh, they're neither uh, inherently one nor inherently different. So the phenomenon that depends on something else and that which it depends on, they're neither uh, inherently one or inherently different, or they don't exist as one and different from their own side. <laughs>
So, for instance, when you plant a seed, so actually the seed is something quite small. It's a small kind of uh, uh, roundish kind of thing. Or in the case of like when you when you take a mango, so here's a little bigger, bigger, the kind of mango seed is slightly bigger, uh, which then leads to an even bigger fruit. So when you when you put the mango seed in the in the ground, then on the basis of that, on the basis of that, then later on you have a, a, a mango tree. So you say, I'm planting a mango tree. So, to just think the piece of uh, uh, the piece of um, the, the, the piece of toilet paper Gishla is just kind of crumbled in his hand. So, think this is the seed. So, when you plant this seed, when you put this in the ground, you're saying this is the seed of a tree. So this is the, the this is the seed of a tree. This is the the seed of the fruit or the seed of the tree. So that's how it appears to the mind. So um, he is saying this is the seed of the the fruit here. Uh, in in reality, you don't have a fruit here yet. So in reality, there's no fruit. So we just basically impute. In reality, so there's no no fruit yet. All you have is the seed. Uh, so where 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 is the kind of fruit here? What kind of uh, fruit or what kind of uh, where can you find that the, the, the so you have a seed of a fruit? But um, so where can you find this kind of particular fruit? It's not there in this moment. In what country has it grown? In which country has it uh, come into existence? If you have just the seed. So there is no, there's no fruit. I'm sorry, there's no, there's no tree. Sorry. Uh, so sorry, I, I said fruit, but I meant tree. So if you, if you don't have a tree, how can you have the seed of a tree? <laughs> so when we say here the seed of a tree actually it's just from the way it's just by, by, the, by way of appearance so when we take the seed actually there's just a seed there's no tree yet but it seems there's an actual tree so to our mind there's this clear appearance of this kind of tree which is not yet there yet so it's something that will arise in the future but it's not there yet but to our mind, it appears already as a tree. So something appears already to our to our mind. So that is just there from the from the side of the appearance or from the point of view of the appearance. So therefore, we say the seed of a tree here from from its own side. That is, in reality, there is no tree. But it exists from the point of view of its appearance to the mind. Or alternatively, we can say that the the tree we are talking about here, so the seed and the the, the tree that arises later, those two phenomena are related as cause and effect. So we say they're cause and effect, so therefore they're different. We speak of them as different phenomena because one is the cause and one is the effect. So here, with regard to saying a tree, when we designate tree, uh, we, we, we plant a tree here when we plant the seed. So here we're saying that after six months or after one year, uh, a, a tree actually starts to grow as it comes into, into existence. So it's therefore their cause and effect, they're related to cause and effect. So, so if the tree uh, grows or comes into existence after one year, let's say it takes a year for the tree to grow, 
now it's August, right? So from August. So when we say, so uh, so when we say uh, the the tree and here the tree in the city. So when we say the tree, it takes one year for the tree to arrive. So now in the Tibetan calendar, it's the eighth month or August. So let's say uh, from now on, this tree, will this tree grow before January 2018 or after January 2018? So the first month of 2018, will it grow before that? Will it be there before uh, January 2018 or will it arrive later? So before January 2018, we have the seat. We don't have the tree. So if the tree, <laughs> so if the if the tree grows next year, it will be August 2018. So the, right now we only have the seat. We only have the seat. So we will have the tree only next year in August 2018. So therefore, the tree will not be there before January 2018, but afterwards. But only afterwards. All we have right now is the seat. So therefore, so therefore, before uh, January 2018, that which is the result, so in relation to cause and effect, they're related to cause and effect, but actually before that, you don't have the effect. So even though you speak of cause and effect, but you don't have the effect now, or you don't have it before January. <laughs> <laughs> the more I explain, the more you get confused. <laughs> if I give the, the example in more detail, you, you seem to be mo getting more confused. <laughs> so if we analyze here, we say that the seed and the sprout, there are cause and effect. But at the time of the seed, there is no effect. At the time of the effect, at the time of the tree, there is no seed. So if at the time of the seed, there, are no, there is no effect, there are no cause and effect at the time of the seed. If at the time of the, the tree, there is no, no cause, then again, at that time, there are not cause and effect. So when is the time that they're actually cause and effect? If they're not cause and effect at the time of the cause, and they're not cause and effect at the time of the result, so when are they cause and effect? When can we say that the seed and its result, the tree, are actually cause and effect? So when we search, when we analyze, when we look for it, we don't find an exact time that we can posit as being the time when the seed and its tree uh, relate as cause and effect. So in reality, therefore, upon searching, therefore, in reality, we cannot say that in reality the seed and its result are cause and effect. So, therefore, it's just by way of appearance here when we say we have the seed, we plant the seed, and on the basis of that, one day you have a mango tree. So you have a, a mango tree that arises from that. So, it's just by way of appearance, it's mere appearance that therefore we say cause and effect are infallible, that from a cause you have a result. So, this infallibility is a mere appearance to the mind that cannot be found. So 
So here, therefore, we say phenomena are merely dependent. So the two types of dependence we speak of here. So basically, we cannot say that that which depends, uh, that which is, so those two things, one depending on the other, that those two phenomena are uh, uh, truly different or that they're truly one. We can't really talk about it. It's merely, the, it's that they're merely imputed. So in that sense, this uh, removes the two extremes, the extreme of nihilism and the extreme of verification in the sense that phenomena are not non-existent, but they also do not exist from their own side. So this is true for in, in most situations. And so, uh, but this will become clearer as we go along. Uh, uh, we go down uh, along the text. Uh, do you have any questions? You can ask questions if you have any questions. You could pass a piece of paper if you want, uh, or unless you wanted to uh, directly ask. Otherwise, you could give me a written piece of paper. You could write down your question. Any questions? So His Holiness spoke about today, His Holiness spoke about uh, subjective clear light and objective clear light. So objective clear light or uh, uh, clear light from the point of view of the object or clear light from the point of view of the subject. Uh, could Geshe-la please give some clarification as, uh, with regard to those two concepts? So when we talk about uh, objective uh, clear light, uh, we talk about emptiness, so there's emptiness itself. So when we talk about subjective clear light, he's just saying, I can't explain this, um, you know, I can't exactly explain this, it's difficult to explain. So I, he's, he, he's wondering, does that refer to the wisdom or the mind realizing emptiness or not? So here, when we speak about this term, this, this term of clear light, it actually comes from the tantric system. So here we speak of this extremely subtle mind, the, the, the subtle mind of clear light, or the clear light mind. So this is where the term comes from. So uh, I cannot... So this... Uh, I, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear because the uh, microphone wasn't working. I didn't hear what Genla said. Could you? Genla, do you hear something? Genla, do you hear something? Because I don't know well, uh, therefore the microphone uh, broke down. It's not working. Because of Genla not being able to explain this clearly. So other questions? Sorry, I, I, the Chinese group requested the teaching, so I let them have some questions and then I ask. Sorry, I was talking while the question was read in Tibetan. I'm sorry, didn't hear. 
So the question is with regard to liberation, I suppose. The question is, Aria, like an Aria being, uh, what is an Aria being? Oh, so, uh, so the question was, I, I suppose, that if you're an Aria being, a person who's realized emptiness directly, have you removed any uh, all ignorance? And Geshe says no. So a person who realizes emptiness, the moment you realize emptiness directly, you become an Aria. But at that time, you have not yet removed ignorance. So when you realize emptiness, when you realize emptiness directly, at that time you remove the um, intellectually acquired uh, afflictions, but you, you still, you're still left with the um, innate afflictions, the innate afflictions you have not yet removed. So therefore we talk about a learner aria and a non-learner aria. Yeah, <laughs> So here, so what you're saying here is that when we talk about an orange seed, that, that gives rise to an orange tree, it does not give rise to an apple tree. This is because one depends on the other. Here we speak of the dependence. So the orange tree depends on the orange seed, uh, uh, and not vice versa. It's not that the orange seed, uh, that the apple tree depends on the orange seed. So in that sense, it's because of their dependence, therefore, that we can say one gives rise to the other and not vice versa. So therefore, the apple tree does not depend on the on the orange seat. So therefore, uh, therefore, this when we talk about this connection here, therefore, uh, one does not depend on the other. Therefore, you don't have an apple tree from a uh, orange tree. Whereas on the on the from an orange seat. Whereas on the other hand, there's a connection between the two, the orange seat and the orange tree. But if it existed in reality, if that connection existed inherently or in reality, then we should be able to actually find it. And this we cannot find. So, so, there, but it, does it exist from its own side? Is there a truly an inherently existent connection? Well, when we look for it, we cannot find it. Why? Because at the time of the seed, you don't find the tree. At the time of the tree, you don't find the seed. Moreover, you can't find some connection on the basis of the seed. You can't find a connection to the tree on the uh, on the ba- connection to the tree on the basis of the tree. Based on the tree, you don't find the seed. So therefore, when you look for it, that connection cannot be found. So this is merely imputed. This and doesn't exist from its own side.
So usually uh, we have a sense that whatever exists must exist from its own side. It's like uh, from the moment we were born, we had the sense that phenomena must exist from their own side. In fact, since beginning this time, we had the sense, we, we had this notion, or what appeared to us is that phenomena, we have the appearance of whatever appears, it must exist from its own side. So all phenomena appear to us since beginning this time to exist from their own side. So therefore, when we hear phenomena do not exist from their own side, when we have some kind of concept, when we develop some kind of idea or some kind of concept with regard to phenomena not existing from their own side, then there is a sense that this is impossible because then this does no longer make sense. If phenomena do not exist truly, then this would not make sense. This would not make sense. This is because everything, everything that exists is mixed with this inherent existence. So we cannot think along the lines of separating phenomena existing from their own side. So since we cannot separate phenomena, we cannot consider the possibility of phenomena not existing from their own side. We see contradictions with regard to that. But when with regard to the presentation or the, 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 the with regard to phenomena's mode of existence here, there's only two ways in which phenomena can exist. Either they exist by way from their own side, or they do not exist from their own side. There's no other possibility. So, uh, when we take the reasonings here, when we apply logical reasoning uh, with regard to phenomena existing from their own side, we will come to see that it does not make sense that phenomena exist from their own side. It, it is in contradiction to logical reasoning, it's in contradiction to uh, reasoning. So then, the only option we are left with is that phenomena do not exist from their own side. So even though initially we cannot accept that, uh, due to the lack of familiarity, we cannot accept that, but once we become familiar with that, we can eventually accept that phenomena do not exist from their own side. <laughs> So through familiarity, by habituating ourselves with this idea of a lack of true existence, a lack of existence from its own side, eventually we will feel comfortable with this idea, that we won't see any contradiction, we will feel com uh, comfortable with this concept. <laughs> So, uh, uh, as Geshe-la, as a, as a uh, scholar, so he has studied about the Madhyamika, he's, he's familiar, he's trained his mind uh, with regard to the Madhyamika reasoning, and so uh, for him it's easy to say that it's not okay to say that phenomena do not exist, for, do exist from their own side. <laughs> <laughs> so even though Gishma is able to apply the reasoning and he's familiar with the reasoning that refutes inherent existence, but if he looks at his holiness, uh, looking at his holiness, uh, kind of considering his holiness and saying that his holiness does not exist from his own side as a special person, that seems impossible. So this is very difficult. So innately, Gishma feels that his holiness from his own side must be a special person. There's not a sense that it's just uh, through the mode of appearance of his holiness. This is the lack of familiarity. It's because of the lack of familiarity that Geshe finds it hard to consider his holiness to exist in that way. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to read the question. Sorry. Uh, 
I apologize. The question was, if phenomena don't exist inherently, there must be a connection nonetheless, like uh, the connection between uh, an apple seed and an apple tree, because otherwise you would have oranges from an apple seed uh, if there was not such a connection. And so again, I gave that answer. <laughs> Uh, you want to understand the difference between dependence and inter so what what would it be if something existed independent, what would that be? Okay. So again, I said the difference between um, so the, the, the translator says, I don't understand the question exactly. Um, so the question seems to be if phenomena are a cause and an effect on one hand, so but then again they're like a dream. So if there is cause and effect, however, they're just like in a dream, how can I in the future become a Buddha if phenomena are just like in a dream? So it seems like how can you become a Buddha if now you generate the causes and conditions? How in the future can you reach the result instead of a Buddha? That seems to be the so here <laughs> my city So here the, the, the question can be divided into two aspects, or there could be two types of looking at this question. One way is to take the example of the mango seed and the mango tree, knowing that a mango tree a uh, mango seed gives rise to a mango tree, we then analyze, is there a truly existent connection, is there a truly existent cause and effect relationship between the seed and between the, the mango tree. So at that time when we analyze, we engage in ultimate analysis, or what is called ultimate investigation, ultimate analysis. Or the question could be a different one. Is it possible to, from this seed to have a mango tree? So someone, someone may disagree and say this is not a mango seed. This is a different type of seed. It's an apple seed. So therefore, there may be the discussion that this particular seed cannot give rise to the result mango seed. Mango seed. So basically, there's what, what does the question refer to here? This is the question. Does it refer to just saying there's? Is it, are you discussing uh, the possibility of Buddhahood from the point of view of saying there's no truly existent um, connection, or are you saying it's not possible in general, so that there are no causes and conditions for Buddha? So there's two ways of considering this question. Okay. 
啊，祈愿的这个因，他为什他是他？你你要问的是第一种生意的角度问，还是一般的角度问？林立，请问请当开发卡的同事。What is the difference between those two questions? The lady is asking, what is the difference between the two questions? So, So one way to consider the question would be like you have already understood that from a mango seed you have a tree, but you're still considering、uh, the, the 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 validity in terms of reality. That is there a truly existing seed, a truly existing connection between the seed and the and the tree, or likewise with regard to、uh, Buddhahood, you know that these causes, making certain prayers and aspirations, etc., lead to Buddhahood, but you're now wondering, is it just an appearance to the mind, or is there an actual Buddhahood? So that would be one way of、uh, positing the question, having already accepted that one can become a Buddha, but wondering, is there actual Buddhahood? Is there actual Buddhahood that is being obtained? How could that be if it's just an appearance to the mind? So this would be one way of considering the question the lady asked. It's the second question. It's the second. So she's wondering whether there are actually causes and conditions that conventionally give rise to Buddhahood. So it's conventionally done. So I'm saying that、uh, here, when we talk about just conventionally uh, analyzing or uh, examining whether it's on a conventional level possible to become a Buddha, well, here、uh, it's difficult to say. But just through aspiring Buddhahood, just wishing for Buddhahood, and praying for it,、uh, we can't say that that is、uh, sufficient as a cause that would give rise to Buddhahood. But on the basis of this aspiration, on the basis of aspiring to become a Buddha, we then engage in the six paramitas. And then,、uh, uh, as a result of engaging in the practice of the six perfections or the six paramitas, then、uh, one is able to do it. In general, your question is very important. So I'm. So otherwise,、uh, if you like say, well, if you do this, you become a Buddha. If you do this, you become a Buddha. If it was just like that, well, of course the question needs to arise because anything can become a cause of Buddhahood. But we need to be very specific here. We need to、uh, be able to understand what is it specifically that is needed、uh, to take us to enlightenment. Because、uh, if we just say this takes us to to enlightenment, that is not sufficient. <laughs> so it's an important question. It's an easy question, but the answer is very difficult. So it's important. It's easy to ask, ask this question, but it's difficult. So it's difficult in a short time, in a short period of time. To be honest, it's difficult in a short period of time、uh, to give a, a, a extensive or sufficient answer. So、um, actually, when we talk about the path, the Mahayana path,、uh, it can be、uh, it's it subsumed under. So the, the six perfections are subsumed. It's all. Subsumed under the six perfections. 
So uh, first one needs to explain generosity, um, morality, patience, and so forth. So those have to be explained in order to understand the Mayana path, which is subsumed under the perfection. So then, how do those six paramitas, those six perfections, how do they give rise to Buddhahood? Well, in order to understand that, we first need to clarify what does it mean to be a Buddha? What is Buddhahood? So first we need to understand the different qualities, the different attributes or the different qualities of a Buddha. We need to understand those. And we need to understand the different qualities, the different attributes of the six perfections and the paramitas. And then, uh, what is important, or what we need, the, ne the next step would then be to understand the perfection of generosity, for instance. What kind of quality give, does that give rise to? What kind of enlightened quality does that lead to? Or with regard to um, morality, with regard to patience and so forth. So each of those qualities, or each of those uh, paramitas, what qualities in the Buddha's continuum does it give rise to? So anyway, um, with regard to the to the corrugated iron. So um, with regard to this assembly hall here, it's similar to this assembly hall. So if you want to build an assembly hall, first you need to see what are the ingredients or what are the the the, the things that you need initially as the building blocks that make this assembly hall. So you have a window, you have a roof, you have you have wood, you have uh, you have windows, you have a roof, etc. So you need to understand the function of each of these of these building blocks, and then if you understand that, then you can understand that if one of those is missing, so you need the bricks, you need the iron, etc. So then you can understand if any of those is missing, if any of those, for instance, if you didn't have the bricks. What would be the problem? What would be the the, the fault? Uh, what would be the uh, so what would be the the um, the problem if you didn't have, for instance, the corrugated steel or the iron uh, that the, uh, is, the, is the roof that forms the, the roof? So then you can understand uh, how the building cannot come into existence if any of those ingredients in any of these building blocks is missing. Uh, so in that sense, therefore, uh, we're similar here. We understand that if there are certain uh, uh, practices when they are missing, then one cannot reach the state of the Buddha. If any of those are missing, uh, uh, enlightenment is not possible. So we need to understand first what is the necessity of all these steps to then understand if any of those are missing, the resultant enlightened state is not possible. So also some may think that the prayer, that the actual words of the prayer, praying to become enlightened, that is the actual prayer, and this is a cause of enlightenment. Uh, but actually, those are just this is just the is the word. This is not the prayer itself. The words, the words of the prayer, are not the prayer. Uh, 
So if you just recite these words, it may I become enlightened, that will not become a cause of enlightenment. So here you need to generate um, a, a wishful thinking, like an aspiration, you need an aspiration, striving towards enlightenment, unless that is there, unless you have that uh, wish or the aspiration, you cannot get there. So initially we need to understand the qualities of a Buddha and also need to understand that it's possible for us to become a Buddha. And only after one has reached that understanding, then the wish to become a Buddha oneself, that aspiration uh, can grow, can be generated in one's continuum. So that would therefore be the prayer or the aspiration to become enlightened. So that should suffice. And so there's a second part to the question that Lady asked. So this, so said, I don't understand the question. Before Gina said, so for instance, in this, in this assembly, we need different building blocks. So there are different building blocks of this building so saying that they exist. So, do we grasp at this? Do we apprehend this? How, how do, why do we have this appearance of the different building blocks? In our mind, we have... So also the things appear to our mind. So why do they appear to our mind? Why do they? So does our mind uh, apprehend them and therefore they appear? So or does the uh, does the apprehension itself appear? So is it because of apprehending the object that the object appears to us? Or is, so is it therefore due to the apprehension, due to the holding onto the, the object? So do we actually have to get rid of the apprehension in order to get rid of the appearance? Is this something we have to overcome? If we don't have the apprehension, if we don't apprehend objects, then objects no longer appear to us. Is that how, how it works? <laughs> so what did the Chinese translator say? I didn't understand the question, but she, she asked the question. And the second question she also didn't understand, but she asked the question. <laughs> So actually when we say a variety of different phenomena, we, we see a variety of phenomena. That is, a variety of different phenomena appear to us, and a variety of different phenomena are apprehended by us. We don't say there's any fault with that. We don't say this is something we need to overcome. This is not considered to be faulty. Uh, to have phenomena appear or to apprehend phenomena. But the fault is that whatever appears to us, we perceive these phenomena uh, to exist from their own side, to exist as being, uh, as, as, as being able to um, um, sustain themselves, as being um, able to uh, sustain themselves, as in like existing in and of themselves. So that perception of phenomena, that's the fault, that's the problem. So 
So taking it to a different level, an even more difficult level, when we say we're taking it to a, a level that is harder to understand, well, then we talk about, uh, when we say, for instance, a Buddha, does a Buddha directly, through the force of the Buddha's perception, does the Buddha directly perceive this is a table, this is this, this is that? No, that's not, it's not directly uh, from the mind of the Buddha, uh, but it's indirectly. But that is difficult to understand, and there's a lot of discussion uh, we need to engage in in order to understand that properly. <laughs> I'm not finding anything to use as an example. <laughs> because looking around, I can't find an example to, to show you. <laughs> so, so this is now a tree. This is no longer a seat. <laughs> this is now a tree. <laughs> Think of it as a tree. <laughs> Tree. You notice it's become longer in shape, now it's a tree. <laughs> so in one country, in, 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 one, in one place, this is called Kushu. So this is, this is called so this is in one country, this is called an apple, what we call tree, in another country it's called apple. Ale, sorry, not, not apple, not that. poison. Sorry. Uh, so if, if, if I say this is poison, if, I, if someone designates poison on that for me, that would be something that's harmful, I wouldn't eat it. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood. So when Gisela was saying this is a, a piece of fruit now, so in one country this would not be called an apple, this would be called poison. So I would not eat this if I were to perceive it as being poison the way I understand it to be poison, whereas in another country it would be like saying eat the poison. Why? Because I don't perceive this to be poison. If I, uh, uh, if I call this an apple, then for me this is not poison. I would not uh, directly perceive this to be something poisonous. So it's dependent on that term, on the term that has been, has been designated here that you would then say, eat, I eat poison, etc. So therefore, so therefore, when the Buddha gives us instruction is saying that this is something we should adopt, this is something we should avoid, uh, this is something virtuous, non-virtuous, etc. So this distinction that the Buddha draws, the Buddha draws independence on our own perception of these objects. It's because of how we perceive them that the Buddha says we should avoid this, we should do this, etc. It's not that the Buddha actually perceives them himself as being such a thing, but it's rather independent on our perceptions, independent on how we perceive the world. Uh, in accordance to that, the Buddha therefore gives instructions uh, in, in terms of what is to be avoided, what is to be adopted, etc. Uh, so therefore there's the basis therefore, we understand that kind of explanation, there is a basis based on which therefore the Buddha then, Buddha teaches. So, with regard to those who have studied the Madhyamika system, then there's a lot of debate, as in like, it's okay to say that, but it's not okay to that, so a lot of debate may arise. But this is with regard to those who studied the Madhyamika in great detail. In the Pazangika system, the Pazangika asserts that the disintegratedness of a phenomenon is a functioning thing or impermanent. Could Gishala please explain this a little bit? <laughs> so you're allowed to... You're allowed to ask easy questions. So <laughs> why do you ask difficult questions? Mm. 
节注意一下。那我说还没有问题，意思是说，请问简单一点的问题，这样干嘛都一直问那么难的问题呢？这个问题是，中观应成派说灭是物，那请大家做一下解释。So actually, when we talk about uh, the worldly kind of from, our, from the point of view of our worldly experience, then the disintegratedness of of a phenomenon, uh, this, this disintegratedness is impermanent. So the seizing, the seizing of a phenomenon, a phenomenon going out of existence, a phenomenon disintegrating. All this has to be, all those have to be positively be impermanent, have to be understood to be impermanent. So, when our lifespan is exhausted, we die. So, when the fuel is exhausted, um, um, a, a butter lamp will go out of existence, or a lamp, or a, a lamp will go out of existence if the fuel is exhausted. Um, so, actually, we should we need to say that uh, uh, this disintegratedness of a vase, for instance, is impermanent because actually, uh, well, but it's difficult to assert that. It's difficult to accept that. Um, so there, this is why some philosophers would not accept that. Why? Because when we say the vase having gone out of existence, existence, the vase having ceased. So the vast no longer being there. That's that disintegratedness of a vast. It's very difficult to point at it. It's very difficult to say this is it. This is the disintegratedness of a vast when there's no longer a vast. So you can't say the place where the vast used to be or the place um, now where the where you find the absence of a vast that that is the, the, the disintegratedness of a vast. That would not make sense. Here we talk about a disintegratedness and uh, a vast having gone out of existence here uh, we need to point that out. We need to look at that and understand that, but it's very difficult to understand it on the basis of a, uh, a vase itself, So, because the vase is gone. This is why in the lower systems that do not accept existence from its own side, they have such difficulty because saying that this is a functioning thing, for them, uh, this is an object of a conceptual mind. You, you, you need to depend on or rely on a conceptual mind, and then if you rely on a conceptual mind, its object uh, needs to be permanent. If you cannot perceive it directly, but you need to depend on a conceptual mind, then the object of that conceptual mind should be something permanent. So the, the vast having gone out of existence is therefore, according to the lower systems, must be something permanent, uh, since it's a, a type of an abstract object. However, in the higher, in the present ego school, it's something impermanent. So, uh, with regard to this the disintegratedness of a phenomenon being a functioning thing that is being impermanent or not, there is a debate between the lower philosophical systems and the prasangika. So, there is disagreement uh, with regard to, to whether it's impermanent or not. Uh, 
So according to the Chitta Mantra system and the Satantuka school, they say that a vas itself is impermanent, but being a vas is permanent. The vas existing is permanent. A vas being a, a particularity or a vas being a generality, those are permanent. A vas being one or a vas being different from something other than itself, all these are considered to be permanent. So the reason they say that, the, the, the kind of main cause of saying so, is that they say these uh, aspects of the vas, so its existence, being a vas, etc., all those can only be understood in dependence on the conceptual mind. It's not that there's something coming from the side of the object itself that could be directly perceived, but rather this is something abstract in the sense that we need uh, we need uh, we need a uh, conceptual mind that uh, uh, allows us or that enables us to perceive being a vast, perceives us uh, the existence of a vast, etc. So this is why we don't say it's impermanent. We say it's permanent. They would say it's permanent. So, but if we then say uh, uh, that the higher system, the Prasangika school says that you don't need a conceptual mind, uh, or even if you do need a conceptual mind, there's no contradiction in saying that the vast is in disintegratedness or the vast having gone out of existence is impermanent. But then the question that arises is, is that in the Prasangika school, could you also say that the existence of the vast or being a vast, that they're all impermanent? If you say that the disintegratedness is impermanent, uh, and then you could also say, well, the being a vast or uh, existence of vast, those are also impermanent. However, this is not clearly explained in the scriptures. It's not clear whether that is accepted in the Prasangika school. <laughs> So actually, here with regard to the functioning of a phenomenon, here we speak of um, um, a, a karmic seed, for instance, in the context of like a karmic seed, Having the, having been uh, left there, and so there's just the, the the disintegratedness of the karmic action. So this integratedness of the karmic action that continues on, and then in the future, uh, you have a result arising from that. So it's in the context of discussing that you don't have a ale vishnaya, you don't have a, a stored uh, facility kind of consciousness here, and so therefore you need to explain how from a cause or from a seed or an imprint you can have a result, uh, karmic result. <laughs> so it's not something we need to discuss here, but since I already started explaining it, might as well continue. <laughs> So actually, when you study the Madhyamika system, when you study the Madhyamika view, actually, uh, usually when we think of a karmic action leaves an imprint, and then that imprint ripens on the consciousness, that's how we consider it, that's how we think about uh, karmic uh, uh, causes, uh, karmic uh, effects arising, and there's not much discussion on the fact that actually what happens is a karmic action is accumulated, and then the seizing, the disintegration of that karmic action, that leads to a result. That is therefore then later on leads to the karmic ripening or the, the, the resultant karmic experience. So it's only mentioned on that, at that occasion. Usually we don't talk along these lines. Even as a follower of the Madhyamika, even studying this view, there's always the sense that there's an imprint that's left, etc. Mm -hmm. 
mon matin, mon petit lèvre, là. Quand il y a un autre, il y a une fille, une fille, une fille, une fille, une fille, une fille, So it's probably because before you study the Madhyamika, that is, before you study actually the Prasangika system, you study the perfectional wisdom sutras, which are from the point of view of the Madhyamika Svatantrika. And they, there you talk about imprints, imprints all the time. So having studied this for so long, it becomes very solid in your mind. It's very difficult to let go of it. So his holiness kind of naturally, again and again, it comes up when his holiness gives teachings, when he says the karmic imprint has disintegratedness, and the disintegratedness of the disintegratedness, etc., that leads to the ripening, that leads to the karmic results. So his holiness again and again just naturally kind of mentions that in his teachings. <laughs> Other questions? So one more question, one last question. Um, is there a difference between is there a difference between the consciousness, the second link of the twelve links, so we have the second link of consciousness, no the third link of consciousness, is there a difference between the third link of the twelve links, the consciousness of the third of the three of the twelve links, as opposed to mental consciousness and consciousness in general? What is the difference between those? So, so this question is not clear, is it? So therefore, a so, this is difficult to translate into English. Um, so, in general, you know, there is a difference between, uh, how can I say that, mind consciousness and mental consciousness. So there's a difference between mind consciousness and mental consciousness. So the Kuchulahi, the monkey, repeated the question again. So the question is like of the, the third link of the twelve links, the third link of consciousness of the of the twelve links, then mental consciousness or mind consciousness and consciousness in general. Is there a difference or not? Um, so when we talk about mind consciousness or mental consciousness here we speak of those two mental consciousness versus a sense, a sense consciousness um, so when we say a sense consciousness a sense consciousness is something that depends on or relies on an empowering condition which is the sense faculty or the sense powers so on the basis of the sense powers an object can appear a physical object can appear whereas with regard to a mental consciousness there's no dependence on such an empowering condition so you can think of the future you can think of the past you can generate love compassion etc and anger so all those uh, can arise well, mental consciousness can arise as all those um, so then uh, when we speak of a mental consciousness it can be divided into mind and mental factors so here a mind consciousness here refers to mind versus mental factors so when we talk of here the mental consciousness in the context of the 12 links, well, here we speak of um, projecting karma, projecting karma that has been accumulated 
and the seeds of which now, or the imprints of which now, are posited on the mental consciousness. So of the, th the three links, the consciousness here is this, this storage kind of consciousness on which you leave the imprints of the projecting karma. So let's uh, recite the Chancho Samjuna Bhuchita, the prayer uh, that boy Bhuchita arise and that which has not arisen grow forever more. May, let's arise, let's not recite that together into that. Just 